The next speaker, we're moving on to the, uh, the mega herbivores now, is Andrea Cucci from Oregon State University. She'll be discussing rhinos with us. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Um, my last time here in Namibia, I had the pleasure of viewing your beautiful wildlife and especially appreciated seeing your black rhinos. So I'm pretty excited to be here today to talk to you about rhino poaching in South Africa. It's a pretty hot topic as we've seen, and I'm going to look at more the criminological aspect of poaching in this, in this uh, presentation. This picture here was actually of a rhino capture that I participated on back in 2004. And interestingly, poaching was not on the radar in South Africa at that time. And just an interesting little tidbit as well, this rhino was found to have several old bullets in him, and that's one thing that wildlife veterinarians told me during this research was that, was that many of the rhinos that they capture for um, auctioning off or for research or even on poaching responses, they find all of these old bullets, some of them just riddled with them. So it just shows you what kind of stress that they're under. Mm. So 2008, we saw an increase in poaching every single year thereafter, and in 2015 and 16, we saw a slight decrease in poaching of rhino in South Africa. We can attribute this somewhat to the, what Kruger National Park has done in terms of security measures. And um, the, the problem with this is that outside of Kruger National Park, we've seen an, a slight increase in poaching in three of the provinces, and they've been quite hard hit this year. And Namibia, as well as um, Zimbabwe have also experienced a slight increase in poaching. Not nearly to this level, but it is a great concern. So I'm looking at the human dimensions, and I hope some of you can join me in my talk later when we look at the attitudes of these different stakeholders um, regarding poaching. But we're going to look at various crime prevention strategies and the perceptions that these stakeholders have towards these interventions. In, um, Research that's out today, there's been a limited number of stakeholders that have been looked at, and they've often been um, limited to, say, a province, for example, or other countries. In this study, I actually interviewed 54 stakeholders across the entire country. I visited six of the nine provinces that were hardest hit by rhino poaching. And these stakeholder groups included everyone from community members that were outside of Kruger National Park, South African police and government officials, um, private game reserve personnel and managers, as well as wildlife veterinarians, and, um, sorry guys, I'm nervous, <laughs> bear with me here, um, as well as, um, yeah, okay, so a lot of different stakeholder groups. Uh, we looked at various concepts in, in designing this research, and trust was a factor that we wanted to know. How do stakeholders feel in terms of trust? Do they trust these, these, um, individuals that are in charge of protecting the rhino to do their job very well. And then we looked at a framework known as conservation criminology. It's, it's a wonderful frame, framework that's come out of um, Michigan State University recently. And it really looks at natural resources as well as humans, more of it on equal terms. It's interdisciplinary in nature. And so we're not just looking at it from specifically a criminological aspect or a sociological aspect, for example, but we're, we're crossing these divides. I have four research questions. I wanted to know what are the stakeholder perspectives on the effectiveness of current and proposed interventions? What are their opinions regarding the characteristics of punishment that offenders should receive? To what extent is corruption, something we don't talk about very often, but we all know it's the pink elephant in the room, to what extent is, extent is this prevalent within the context of rhino poaching? And what are stakeholders' perceptions of trust in the agents and agencies responsible for protecting rhino? I found that the majority of stakeholders were pro-trade. And this is across, now remember, this is across all these different stakeholder groups, with the exception of NGOs, who were primarily anti-trade. The reasons for this were because they felt that it would ensure the success of private rhino owners, the ones that are struggling for financial means. They're, they're not getting handouts from the government, and they're not getting donations from NGOs or private individuals as much as, say, Kruger National Park, for example. Um, and they're also, as we have heard in other talks, they're starting to sell off the rhino, and that's a big concern because they hold so much of the rhino in South Africa and keep them safe. 
lot of stakeholders said, well, there's nothing left to lose. Rhinos are being killed at such a rate. Everything we've tried to do, it, we're still seeing them headed towards extinction. Why not legalize the trade? And then, of course, we could increase the value of the rhino. Those on the anti-trade side said, well, if we flood the market, we'll increase the demand, and then we'll, where will we get these rhino horns? And then we also know that illicit trade and illegal trade are, they're in bed together. How do we know that we can have enough regulation to prevent this from going into the illicit market? Because many of them said, the black market's still going to exist. And then, of course, we're going to set precedents for other species. If we legalize the trade, not just, um, well, I should say the domestic trade was legalized last year, but if we legalize it internationally as well, what does that mean in terms of <coughs> elephants which are, have come next on the pipeline, or penguins even? And then, of course, corruption is a challenge. If we don't tackle corruption from the top down, it doesn't matter what we do in terms of legalizing the trade. Rhinos will still be headed towards extinction. So throughout this talk, I've included a number of quotes from stakeholders, pretty colorful quotes, and it gives a little depth to it. Um, one stakeholder said, what are we going to have to legalize next? Maybe can lion hunting? Maybe ivory poaching? Maybe massacre penguins? What about the old common bee eater? Let's just legalize a whole lot. Help yourself, man. Come into Africa and massacre them. It's cool. So stakeholders were divided in terms of dehorning. This is separate from the trade issue. Um, we're looking at different interventions, trying to look at making these rhinos more hardened targets to deter these rhino poachers. Um, the ones that felt that it was not effective, they cited spatial crime displacement. So if you have a reserve here that has rhinos which are dehorned and a reserve next to them, which have long, heavy, very valuable horns, who do you think the poachers are going to hit? However, with that said, we may say rhinos on this property, but in totality, we're still seeing rhinos lost. And then community members specifically said, a rhino is not a rhino without a horn. And that was very important to them. They, they really viewed, had a holistic view of the rhino as an animal. Wet versus dry horn. Well, the wet horn is what's underneath. When you cut off that horn, that's what the bloody part that's left. That is actually more valuable on the black market than the dry horn, the part that's cut off and put into rhino stock, the horn stocks. And in terms of this, we're the wild rhino, if, if the end user knows that the horn came from the wild rhino versus one that was just dehorned, it's also more valuable. So rhino was still a coach, and we've seen that happen in South Africa. And then a wildlife veterinarian said pain management from dehorning is not well understood. They said rhinos are still, the vocalizations are showing that they're still experiencing pain and the morphine, trying to adjust that morphine level to reduce pain, they've not perfected yet. And then of course, if a dehorning would not be practical in very large areas, and that was something they also talked about. Or areas in which you have a, a, national, a national park such as Kruger that adjusts to the private game reserves and they don't have fences in between them. So these animals are allowed to move freely. One stakeholder said, if you really want that powerful moody, it's in that wet part. All of a sudden, on a couple of them, I noticed that the left ear is missing. Then on some in a different region, there was a patch of skin cut from the back. Well, it's to prove that the horn came from a dead animal, a poached animal. It's not dehorned. All right, now we talked about militarization. A lot of studies have been coming out that said militarization has had a very negative impact on communities. It threatens the stability of communities. It can increase the risk with communities. But I found out that in my study, the community members actually supported having more boots on the ground. <coughs> the ones that didn't were the field managers who were actually out in the field in Kruger National Park. Many of them said, we came into this to do conservation. Now we're working on paramilitary activities or military activities. We don't want more military activities in this park. And when we looked at Punishment. Interestingly enough, South Africans, say, the stakeholders said, we have excellent penalties for these poachers. The problem is they're not ending up going to trial, they're not being convicted. They're being let go two to three days later. They're given their vehicle back, they're given their weapons back, and they're sent on their merry way to go out and do what they do best. And that's why we see so many of them captured again after they've been released and they've captured when they're poaching again. 
Stakeholders said that punishment is not important for level one poachers. And these are the poachers that are on the ground doing <coughs> the actual killing of the rhino. They said because they're, they're replaceable when it comes to these syndicates. These syndicates, as soon as you take out one, they're replacing with 10 more. So we really need to tackle the, the guys up at the higher levels. NGOs, many of the NGO stakeholders wanted shoot on site policies and zero tolerance. Um, they were pretty emotive and you know, something that we'll see throughout this. But that was really just expressed from the NGOs. And when asked if rhino coaches can be rehabilitated, most of the stakeholders said absolutely. The problem is, is that we're letting them go before any kind of rehabilitation can occur. And the ones that do make it into, uh, the ones that actually do make it into the prisons are, are not given what they need in order to you know, be rehabilitated. Here's another quote. Everybody says poach, shoot the poachers, but it should be shoot the syndicates. They're the real, real bad people. And this is a pretty uh, colorful quote. Hot pursuit, and that's when they can chase the poachers across the border into Mozambique and just go right after them without permission. Hot pursuit will change the balance. If South Africa hits that village, then women and children will get killed because they can flatten that village with the military that we've got. And it will be like an Israeli lake strike. There's no question about it. They will flatten those villages because this is a war. When we talk about corruption, we found through these um, stakeholders that they said bribery does occur by the syndicates. Overall corruption has increased. They see an increase in bribery, but they said that um, within the communities that overall they don't believe that community members felt threatened by the syndicates. In fact, they thought that you know, they want to work with the syndicates because it provides them with the opportunity to get money from the poaching. And we're not talking about all community members, we're talking about the poachers themselves. Then there was an issue of uh, fal false permits, delayed prosecution, um, bad prosecution, and trampling over the crime scenes. And that's something we heard about a lot. You know, after a lot of effort put in by these private uh, anti-poachers, cross crossing their T's, dotting their I's, they hand over all this paperwork that should be able to put these guys behind bars, or at least um, put them through some kind of uh, investigation. <coughs> they found that these dockets were being lost, or they were sitting on a shelf collecting dust. Then we also talked um, with them about corruption in, in terms of the government, and they felt that South Africa, was, the government was corrupt, and they, they also mentioned Mozambique as being corrupt. Overall, they said that corruption should be a high priority. Okay, we're gonna look at some of these quotes. We have, we've also got an informant fund. This particular section major was told that unless he gave the name of the informer, they wouldn't give him the money. And another one, this is a, a, a wildlife veterinarian, said, what are they teaching vets at the university? Where are the ethics? I don't want to take my dog to a vet. Who can I trust? An aspiring vet, she was horrified. I think I felt inwardly the same. I hear a rhino has been darted, and I almost have to think, where's my alibi? Where was I? We wanted to know about trust. Do they, do they trust the South African police to protect the rhino? Across the board, there is zero trust in the South African police. This is across all stakeholder groups. Uh, this is a quote that kind of exemplifies this. No, absolutely zero. There's just way, way too much political infighting. The level of cooperation is poor, and that's a big concern. Our normal South African police, I've got absolutely zero confidence in their ability to combat wildlife crime. When we look at the private field majors, or anti-poaching majors, we saw a different story. There was a lot of trust in them. People felt that these guys, they said private guys are there because they have a passion. Most of the people that work in the private reserves are there because they want to be there, they want to work there. And then in terms of the government, when we look at the South African National Defense Force troops, for example. I trust my guys, not all of them, but I know what to say to who, when, and how, you know? So there's some mixed um, emotions in terms of the, the private guys and the, and the government. Some felt that they were the good guys, but that they weren't properly trained to deal with rhino <coughs> issues. And that the priorities were more on, on other issues that were human-related. 
So what we know is that corruption reforms are needed. When we look at short, medium, and long-term strategies, we have to incorporate communities. We have to look at what we're going to do in terms of militarization. We know it's not sustainable because as soon as you take the military away, you, the right approach will come back. So we have to address that. And then long-term strategies, we have to address corruption. Implementing a multi-pronged anti-corruption strategy would include prevention, investigation, and public education. And then in terms of corruption agencies, there's several of them out there, but they do not communicate very well. One idea would be to consolidate the resources into an independent anti-corruption agency. And as simple as it sounds, not having them in different buildings, but having them in the same building where they can talk to each other and work together. Strategies for reducing poaching should include interagency cooperation, community involvement and consideration, and corruption mitigation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for five minutes of uh, questions. Don't go. No, 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 no. You're, you're still here. No. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm Lynn Kimmel from Antioch University in New Hampshire, and my question is, so you found out this information, so now what, what are the next steps to trying to make this happen, some of your suggestions happen? The, the results of this will actually be provided to some of these stakeholders that were very interested in seeing this. Um, one of the things that I did find is that within, say you take a specific agency even, we know that between agencies, they're not communicating very well. But even within agencies, there's a lack of communication. Um, corruption is something that people just, they're afraid to talk about um, in, in public venues or out loud. But when pushed to talk about it, they had a lot to say about it. So we want to get them talking about this. I think that's the next step. Bring this out in the open, get them talking about it. That's the only way we can start to find solutions to it. Do you want to do it later? Is there time? Uh, well, okay, let's see. Are there any more questions for um, the Rhino talk? I have one. Anyone else? Or the chair takes note? Um, I, the question I'd like to ask, and I know it's not central to, to what you're talking about, but why does Rhino farming never become part of the discussion? And when I say that, sustainable, I mean, at lunchtime we had a great discussion about carbon <coughs> shaving of uh, run um, from domesticated runners that um, get played nice music while they're having themselves de -horned. Well, it was, it was part of the discussion, but I had to cut it off due to time, so I can actually address that. Um, we did talk about uh, de as well as farming, and it was viewed by stakeholders kind of as a necessary evil a tool in the toolbox, shall we say. Um, the perceptions that dehorning would work in included looking at the smaller reserves, for example. They said it wouldn't work in, it would not be practical in larger reserves. Um, and then in terms of farming, we're talking about commercial farming. Again, it was looked at as a necessary evil. It, nobody wanted to do that, but a lot of stakeholders felt that it, if it did a little bit of good, if it worked, then they were open to that idea. No, uh, I can just ask, I'm Rodney from Tanzania. In your presentation, you mentioned that I mean, the dry rhino is less demanded than the wet rhino. What's the reason behind? Like when we do the honing, the, um, the wet one is more like, I mean, more demanded. Can you just repeat? Rodney was asking why would the wet horn be worth more than the dry horn? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, it, in, in the case that it came from a wild poached rhino, it wasn't just a dehorned rhino. And that, that goes back to traditional Asian medicine, and that, that's what that would be used for. The, the dehorned rhino, the, the horns that are oftentimes poached um, at a higher level, they, are, they can be used for trinkets or jewelry, different <coughs> things like that, showing off the status and wealth. But when we looked at the wet part, that's more to do with the Asian medicine. Okay. That's, the, that's their cultural beliefs. Okay. 
Sorry, we're out of time, but you know how to find Andrea after this. Great. Thank you, Andrea.